Matthew here in a minute. And um, just kind of get the direction we're going here. We're still going to be back in 1 Samuel 25 this morning. And uh, I want you to pray about the message. God's, God's been dealing with me. How many of you remember what we preached about last Sunday? Remember a little bit about it? We had, in fact, let me go ahead and write this up here real quick. Um, I'm going to write it differently. I'm going to put Abigail right here. This is out of 1 Samuel 25. And then I'm going to put David right up here. Okay? And I'm going to put Nabal down here. Now, I'm doing that for a reason. Okay? Because I think Nabal needs to be down here. Amen? Because that's where he's going. And David, David is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's high and lifted up. Amen? Okay? And uh, I want you to... Anyway, we're dealing with the, the doctrine... That is in Romans 7, and God doesn't just give us doctrine in the Bible, He gives us illustrations of the doctrine. He draws pictures all throughout the Bible. And so the, one of the beautiful, most beautiful pictures I've ever seen in the whole Bible has to do with Abigail and David and Nabal, and we'll get back into that here in just a little bit. So that's kind of where we're headed. But I've been going on just over this in my mind all week long and just kind of thinking about the direction God would have me go and what I was thinking about last Sunday, I may not get to this morning, but I want to tell you what, me and Nabal have not been getting along this week. Okay? See, Nabal, Abigail is your soul. That's, that's who you are. How many of you have a soul? Say amen. Okay? And Nabal is a mean, rotten, vile, disgusting, defect. the word Nabal means fool, and your flesh is foolish. It does foolish things, and it wants corrupt things. Somebody say amen. And if you don't believe that, Ask yourself, how come you rubberneck and slow down at an accident? I mean, we just let, we complain when we're stuck in traffic about the mile of people ahead of us that are slowing down to see the accident. We complain, get mad about that until we get up to it and we're going, oh wow. We love corrupt things. We like to watch, uh, Jerry Springer on TV, okay? We like to watch vile things like that. We like to have our mind, we like to listen to stuff that's junk, amen? Like to read, we like to be around people. That's what our flesh does. That's Nabal. It's very foolish, and Nabal's contradictory to David. David is the Lord Jesus Christ. Abigail is married to Nabal. She's stuck with him, okay? And he's very mean to her, and he's cruel and all this stuff. And we'll get into the story here in a little bit. But I just want you to think about this, and I, I have. I've been mad at Nabal all week long. Okay, God's been showing me Nabal in my Hoggard all week long. And he'll show me that until Nabal's dead. I can't wait for Nabal to be dead. Amen? Okay? Uh, so anyway, uh, God's been dealing with me about that this week. And uh, just seeing a lot of Nabal still in me. So anyway, just kind of ponder that for a while. Romans chapter 7. Are you there in your Bible? Say amen. Do you believe your Bible? See, if you, don't buy, if you don't believe the Bible, you ain't going to believe anything I tell you, all right? Verse 1, Romans 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. If you stop and think about how old the law is, the law is very old, and I'm going to ask you a question. What, is it still wrong in this world to steal something? Amen. It's still wrong. See, see, the law still has dominion over man, doesn't he? Is it wrong to commit adultery? Still wrong, okay? Is it wrong to, to break the Sabbath? You think about that for a minute. The Sabbath day is still Saturday. Now, he did not tell us to get together and have church on Saturday, but he did tell us to rest. And I think you ought to rest. Amen? I mean, that's just what the law... I'd, I would be remiss in my duties not tell you to rest on Sabbath day. Okay? Give your body and your mind a little rest, okay? Uh, is it wrong to... Um, is it wrong to lie? Bear false witness. Is it wrong to covet something that's not yours? Come on, nod your head, say amen, okay? Shout. It's wrong to do those things, and it has dominion over us until... So this Bible's still right. The law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman, this is Abigail, for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, Okay? But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. 
But if her husband be dead and she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, I want to tell you something. Just, just, I want to say this and I'm going to move on. We live in a world today of divorce and adultery. It's all over the place. It is, uh, listen, this country stinks with adultery. It stinks with it. It, and I want to tell you something. You, it's, he's not your soulmate, ladies. Amen. She's not your soulmate. That, and I, and I've heard this, I've heard this from church people. Guy was telling me one time he was having an affair on his wife with another lady in the church. Well, we're soulmates. I don't think my wife, I don't think my wife and I were meant to be together. Well, you shouldn't put a ring on her finger and swore an oath. Amen. And I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say a whole lot about that. I believe God forgives all kinds of sins. Amen. But I'm just going to say to you that if, and people, you know what they'll do, especially in the church, because the divorce rate in the church is higher than it is out in the world. Now, there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is nobody's getting married anymore. Okay? So, I mean, if you don't have marriages, you don't have divorces. And they're just shacking up all over the place and it's still not right. But here's the deal. They, they'll take the law like this and they'll, they'll say, well, that's under the law. We're not under the law anymore. We can do it if we want to. And I want to tell you something. If you negate the validity of the law, especially in this verse right here, then what you're doing is saying that none of this means anything. None of this means anything. The law is the law, and I know what, and those of you who have been divorced and remarried, you're just like the rest of us that are still sinners. And that's why you need grace. Somebody say amen. So anyway, I mean, I, I like giving grace to people, and I mean, we got people of all kinds and all different backgrounds here in this church house, but one thing in common is we love the Lord. Somebody say amen. Okay, so anyway, I'm not telling you to leave your husband. But anyway, so that, that's what he's getting at. And I want you to understand that that law is still in effect today. It still applies. And if it doesn't, then this whole deal that Paul's talking about means absolutely nothing. Means nothing. So I want you to watch this. Verse 4. Uh, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit... Unto God. Now I want you to think about a fruitful Christian or someone who is, who has a fruitful life. That doesn't mean that you're, that you're bringing in souls every week to the, to the church house. That's not, the, the manifestation of fruitfulness in your life is not how many people are getting saved because of you. The manifestation of the fruitfulness of your life is do you love people? Do you have joy in your heart? Do you have peace with God? Are you long suffering? I mean, all the gifts and the manifestations of the Spirit in your life, are they present in your life? That is the fruitfulness of a Christian. And if you have those things, then people will see you as a testimony to Jesus Christ and they will follow your faith. Do you believe that? Say amen. Now, and let me tell you what, let me, uh, let's see here. What did I have? Matthew chapter 6. Let me go back here to, uh, 1 Samuel. Everybody take your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel, because we're going to end up there. 1 Samuel chapter 25. And uh, I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. You can stay there in, in 1 Samuel if you want. Don't have to flip back and forth. Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 24. Here's what, the, here's what our Savior said. Big red letter words in my Bible. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, and I want you to watch this now. No man, no man can serve two masters. How many of y'all know that to be true? So let's, I'm going to stop right here. Let's just break this down for a minute. Here's Abigail. She represents the soul of man. And the Bible says she's a beautiful woman. She's very wise of understanding and all this stuff. And this is your soul, Okay. Now, whether you're, whether you're saved or you're lost, this is your soul right here. And here's, here's the deal. Let's say, let's say that Abigail lives in, in the 21st century, okay? And let's say that Abigail's, I mean, she's got, a, she's got a husband and a boyfriend on the side. Is that, is that turning out to be pretty common? Abigail's got a husband and she's got a boyfriend on the side. And that's turning out to be really common today. Or, or we'll have, we'll bunch, have a bunch of whoremongering young men that'll be, he'll be having a quote unquote a girlfriend, but then he'll go to the club one night without her, and she'll be with, and he'll be with some other gal at the club, and then he'll come home to her. Is that getting to be pretty common? 
This, this is the world we live in right now. And it's, it's a sickening world. And you have to ask yourself, what is that doing to their children? It's messing their minds all up. And these children are not getting the anchor of Jesus Christ inside of a Sunday school or church somewhere. And it's messing their minds completely up. We, we have no hope in this country without Jesus Christ in this Bible being back as the forefront of what we need in this country. Can I get you to say amen to that? There's no hope in this country because we're not a very good people anymore. But what is commonplace now is a man will have multiple girlfriends or multiple shack-ups or this and that. And what he'll try to do is that, I want to tell you something, it is, you can say what you want to about how, how you don't believe that uh, marriage is good for anything and you can just go this and that and the other. But I want to tell you something, if you're dating some gal, you know what she's got inside of her? This is my man and nobody else can have him. Amen. I don't care how wretched and Jezebel she is. She's got that in her mind. This is my man and nobody else can have him. And you go ahead, buddy. You go ahead and try dating two gals at the same time. You will believe that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. You know why that is? Because God doesn't just write laws on stones. He writes them inside the hearts of people. We have His law, not just as Christians, we have His law on the inward part of us, and everybody in the world knows that it's filthy and vile and bad to be shacking up or married to somebody else, somebody, and, and be going out with somebody else. Everybody knows that that's wrong. And if you don't think that's wrong, then why are you trying to keep it a secret? But that's what everybody does. Everybody tries to hide it. But here's the deal. No man can serve two masters. You cannot, you cannot have it both ways. And I want to preach this to lost people and to saved people. I don't care who's listening to it. You cannot have Nabal and David at the same time. You can't do it. Let me read, let me read to you what our Savior said. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot do it. It doesn't work in the real world. It doesn't. Let's say that. Uh, oh, let's say here. Let's. Okay, I'm going to pick on Brady for here a minute. McBrady. McBrady manages a McDonald's store down in Deloge. Okay, and he's running that store. Now, what else he's doing? I'm just making this up. What else he's doing is he's he's working at a, at the Hardee's right across the road there. Okay, and he's managing the McDonald's, but he's putting in time over at Hardee's over there. And all of a sudden, McDonald's finds it out. What are they going to do to McBrady? You got to make a McChoice. <laughs> Amen. You cannot you cannot serve two masters. Let's say Jared was working for a roofing company and then working for the competitor on the side. Can't have it both ways. Okay? You work for one company and then you go to work for the competitor at the same time. Somebody's going to get rid of you. It, it's that way in the business world. It's that way in the family relationships world. And why do we think that we can exist that way in the church world? I'll never know. But that's exactly that what we really want. You know, how we, you know how corrupt we are? We do want it both ways. We want, and I want to tell you what, well, I want to tell you what the churches of America are sick with, is churches of America are sick with church members who love Nabal, and yet they want to say they love David. But the truth of it is, if you love Nabal, you don't love David. But they're making it look like they're telling they're living in worldly fashion. Even the preachers, even the preachers, are living in a worldly fashion and and giving everybody the world and saying you can it's okay you can do this you can be this way to the point now they're telling people it's okay for you to be a sodomite you can still come to our church it's okay don't worry about it and I'm telling you something you cannot love the flesh and love God at the same time. It's not that it's not a good idea. Jesus said you just can't do it. Because if you love Him, that means you don't love Him. It's not just, well, we advise you it's not a good idea. If you, and I won't say this, I'll say it backwards. If you love David, if you love Jesus, then you won't love Nabal. Amen. 
And the closer I get to the Lord Jesus Christ, the more I hate this guy right here. I hate him. I don't want to be around him anymore. Can't stand. And when I'm saying him, I'm saying this right here, me. I hate my flesh. I hate what I think. I hate what I do. I hate what I say. I hate what I hear. I hate what I see. I hate everything about me. But I love the Lord. And I want to tell you something. If you want revival in your life, then you need to fall in love with the Lord. And you need to figure out that this guy, he ain't worth having anymore. That's what you need to figure out. Instead of you playing your little games of, well, I can do this, but I can do this at the same time. It does not work. James said, does a fountain produce sweet water and bitter at the same time? No. Jesus said, I would that you were either hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. You're trying to have both in your life and you can't do it. There is no mixture of light with darkness. That is a false idea. Somebody say amen. There is no good with evil, and there is no... That yin-yang symbol, you've seen it. The yin-yang means there's good and evil, and evil and good. And it's fused together. That's wrong. It's not that way. There is... You cannot have both in your life. You will be one, or you will be the other. Let me hear God's people say amen. Now... That's, uh, that didn't take but about ten minutes. That was what was on my heart this morning. Now I want us to go to 1 Samuel 25. Um, here we have David, and I won't read the whole text this morning. Uh, if you weren't here last Sunday, go read it on your own and kind of catch up a little bit. But here we have, um, here we have David, and David's kind of on the run because Saul's after him, and David's got him a little army, and... Um, he found out in verse 4 there was a man by the name of Nabal, and Nabal did shear sheep. And Nabal was a very wealthy man, but he was very covetous, and he was all these wicked things, and he's representation of our flesh. And so he sends young men to Nabal and says, uh, Nabal, uh, t- you know, tell him, Nabal, hey, God bless you. Uh, you know, we're just kind of passing through here. We've been fighting the battles. Uh, can, we, uh, can, we have, uh, can we have something to eat? And Nabal uh, threw a big old fit, and he got mad. In fact, let's pick it up here. Um, in verse 10, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25, in fact, you know what, let's do, let's pray before I, uh, let's pray before I get to preaching. All right, before the sermon starts, let's pray. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 10 is where we'll pick it up. Let's, let's ask the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you, Lord, for grace. I thank you, Lord, for your long suffering with me and your kindness to me, God. And, uh, Lord, I, I just, um, the older I get and the closer I get to you, God, the more I just don't like me. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you'd save me out of this body of flesh one of these days and and carry me home to your kingdom. Thank you, dear God, for your mercy and your goodness. And Father, Lord, uh, just give us a good lesson today and teach us, Lord, something that we need to know. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would help us all with your amazing grace. Bless the preaching of your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now I want you to look at this because there's a, a wonderful, wonderful illustration here. David, as we said earlier, David represents the Lord Jesus Christ. David is a, he's a warrior, he's a captain, he's the captain of the guard. David's fighting a battle against the devil and all the enemies of God. Somebody say, Amen. That's who David is, okay? And David is, is watch this, David is, is trying to be nice with Nabal. He's trying to be nice with Nabal. God is long-suffering with our flesh, isn't he? Isn't he long-suffering with us? You know what that means? He has suffered long. That means he has put up with us for a long, long time. I've been in church. I was, I was telling Mike a while ago, I've been in this church since I was a child. I have not been perfect. I've not been very good at times. And I can tell you, it just seems like a lot of times God's just putting up with me more than he is anything else. God is long-suffering with my flesh. Amen? That's why you're not dead yet. Okay? Now, even God's long-suffering has a line. And I'm here to tell you, according to the Bible, that God, God long-suffered. The Bible says God long-suffered in the days of Noah. God long-suffered with the people in Noah's time and gave them, the whole time that Noah was building that ark, God gave them space to repent. But they never did. And God finally said, it's done. I've had it. I'm done with it. 
There's, it, man has gone past the point of no return. And I want to tell you about all those games that you're playing with God right now. God's got a line. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So God drew the line in the days of Noah. He shut the door of the ark. And it was over with. And just because they were outside the ark when the rains were coming down, beating on the side of the ark, God didn't say, oh, well, maybe we should let them in. Now they want in. I want to tell you something. Upon the, when you draw your last breath and you're standing before the judgment throne of Almighty God, then is not the time to repent. Now is. Because God draws a line. But right now, David, he's sending word to Nabal. And he's long-suffering with him. He says, will you, will you help me out here? And look at Nabal's response. And isn't this, isn't this just like us? Nabal answered David's servants and said, verse 10, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? Did you know that your flesh does not know or nor care who God is? Amen? And if you don't believe that, just talk to any atheist. Atheists live in the flesh. And they, listen, I, in fact, I, atheists nothing. You talk to anybody that's out here in this world, and you know what people are involved in? They're into paganism. They're in the New Age movement. They're in the cults galore. They're into all kinds of stuff out there. And you go up there with a, with a gospel tract. You go up there telling them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what they'll do? They'll look at you and say, who's, who's God? Who is Jesus? What is this all about? I remember uh, being at the pharmacy line one time, and it was, it was uh, Good Friday is what it was, right before Easter. And some people in line were talking about this. young guy said, what is Good Friday anyway? You know what that told me? Never been to church a day in his life. Never darkened it. Didn't know. Didn't know that Christ died for him and Christ died for his sins. He might have heard the name Jesus. He might have used the name Jesus in vain. He might have had, but I want to tell you something. His flesh, he was in the flesh, and he did not know who he was. And here's Nabal right here, a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's who Nabal is. And that's who your flesh is. I want to tell you something. There's a reason why that God tells us that you cannot worship God in your flesh. Because your flesh don't want to do it. Your flesh will never, ever, ever serve God. It won't do it. It is unruly. It is foolish. It is, it is rebellious against the laws of God. And it doesn't want anything to do with it. So here's Nabal. You can just see him out there shearing sheep. And all of a sudden these servants come up. Uh, 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 Master Nabal, here come some old boys. I think they're from David. And he's out there and he's mad because he's not standing there making more money. He's got to talk to these guys. And these guys said, hey, we're from David. You know, we're out there trying to save the country and this and that and the other. Will you help us out by giving us a little bit of, get a, get a little bit of meat, a little bit of bread. That's all we need and we'll keep going. We just need a little drink from your well. And Nabal says, who's David? And who's the son? I mean, just mean rascal. Smart aleck. Smart mouth. There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. He's accusing David of being a rebellious, uh, being a, a, just a, a rebellious person. Verse 11, shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have... You notice, notice how personal he is. My bread, my water, my flesh that I have done it. I want to tell you, doesn't that sound like you're a flesh? And you know what, it's, you know, I'll tell you what... And, and you know what it sounds like to me a lot of times? It sounds like to me a lot of church people. Oh, look at what we've done for Jesus. Look at what we've done for God. Look at this, look at that. I want to tell you something. Any church, any church that pats themselves on the back, markets themselves as some big thing, I want to tell you what, that is not God's Spirit in that church. The church is supposed to be, supposed to be submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are His bride. And we're not to go around boasting and bragging about how good we are and how great everything we're doing is. We're supposed to draw attention to our Master, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw them in unto me. It's not your church. i tell you what, they got it backwards. That's because... You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to worship God in their flesh, and you can't do it. God is not going to save your flesh. I don't know if you knew that or not. When you die, what's going to happen to your body? That's why I got Nabal down here. Because that's exactly where you're going. And God does not save your flesh. It's not worth saving. 
He will, however, save your soul because to Him it's precious in His sight. Can I hear you say Amen? So anyway, shall I then take my bread, my water, my flesh that I've killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all these things. And I want you to look at verse 13 now. David, I want, what, I want you to ask yourself a question. When you hear that, that somebody smarted off about you behind your back, when you hear about that, how does that make you feel? I'm going to kill them. They better not see me out behind an alley somewhere. Amen? Look at verse 13. David said unto his men, Gird you on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after, after David about 400 men and 200 to bow by the stuff. You know what David was going to do? He said, I'll kill him. I'll kill him. And here's where we're getting into the message today. I want you to think about it for a minute. When God saw the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai, God said, I'm going to kill them. I'm up here giving them the law, and my laws are good. How many of you agree with that? Say amen. My laws are good, and my ways are right, and I'm up here giving them my laws and they're down there breaking in rebellion against my laws. And God said, I'm going to kill them. And I'm going to raise up somebody else to be my people. What happened in that story? Does anybody know? Moses was already standing with, there with God. And Moses said, Lord, please don't. In fact, watch this. Moses said, take me instead. Lord, don't kill your people. Lest your enemies say he brought them out of the wilderness only to, out of Egypt only to kill them in the wilderness. Don't give your, and you know what Moses was doing? He was pleading with God. And I want to ask you a question. Did God hear him? Now, I want you to listen to this, okay? This, this may, may not be the most profound message in the whole world. But here's how God's been dealing with me and Nabal this week. Okay? Because I'm going to ask you a question. If, if, and you don't have to raise your hand. It's not big a testimony time. If you've ever been in a situation in your life where you knew for a fact that you were not worthy to enter before the throne of Almighty God. You ever been there? I, I've been there. And yet you just took a chance and said, God, I hope you'll hear me. God, will you please? And then you gave God your request. Let me tell you something. God hears prayers. Who in here knows what the name Israel means? Who in here knows what it means? I'm fixing to give you a dictionary lesson. When Jacob was wrestling with the Lord himself, the angel of the Lord, they, he prevailed and prevailed and prevailed, and, he, and the angel said, let me go. And Jacob said, now you listen to this, Jacob said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. Now, I'm going to teach you a little bit about prayer today. Because I, I, you're looking at a guy who believes in prayer. I don't practice it as much as I ought to. But I, I see myself more and more having these little conversations with God. You know, just I'm by myself. God, hey, God, what do you, God help me with this. God help me with that. Now, there are times when I will spend seasons in prayer. I mean, I'll just be laying it out before God. Just, But I have learned over the years that I have not been, nor am I now, nor will I ever be good enough to stand before God and give Him my request. It's, I'm, not good, I'm not that good. Nod your head and say amen. And nod your head and say amen, Mike. You're right. You're not that good. Okay? 
It's okay. But I have a mediator named Jesus Christ who mediates between me and God so that I can go to God in Jesus' name and give Him my request. And God, because He loves His Son, will hear my prayer. How many of you believe that? Say Amen. So watch this now. Here Jacob is being told by the Lord, let me go. Jacob said, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. And I want, to, I want to tell you something. If something is really worth praying about, you'll pray about it until God delivers. Now, you're not looking at a health and wealth preacher. I think that, that's borderline blasphemy. But what I will tell you is, don't let the devil or anybody else talk you out of spending a little time with Jesus. Somebody say amen. Don't let them do that. You have the ability. God gives you the ability. David was ready to go and kill Nabal. And Abigail found it out. I want you to look at this. And we'll get back to Israel in a minute. I don't want to forget that. So anyway, verse um, 18, I'm going to uh, skip on down here. Verse 18, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched corn and 200 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she sent unto her servants, saying, Go before me, behold, I come after you. Behold. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill and beheld David and his men came down against her and she met them. And now David said, Surely in vain have I kept all that, uh, that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So, and more also, do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave all that pertain to him by morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. That re referring to men, the men of, of Nabal. Verse 23, And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass, and fell down before David on her face, and bowed herself to the ground. That is submissive prayer. Now, I want to tell you something. These people going around telling you that you've got, that you, you ought to have, you ought to just get, stand up with God. God, I proclaim God to do this. I do, God, they're, you know what they're doing? They're making God their little slave servant. God, you do this. God, you do that. God, you make me wealthy. God, you give me health. God, you give me this. Go around claiming over everything, everybody. What you do not see in the church of Jesus Christ today is the submissiveness and the humility that ought to be in existence in our lives. Somebody say amen. Abigail, Abigail didn't go down there with a cigarette in her hand and say, Hey, listen here, boy. Yeah. Nabal's my man. You keep your hands off of... That is not, that's not what she did. Listen, when you come to Christ, you don't come all cocky Jezebel. You come to Christ, you bow before Him. He's your Lord. And you reverence the Lord Jesus Christ. When, listen, when, you know what I'm saying to you? When you get ready to pray, you'll kneel, you'll bow. When you get ready to get to get to mean business with Jesus, you will, it'll cause you to get down on your face before God and say, "God, please help me." Mm mm mm. Wow. And see, the reason why that was so funny a while ago, because y'all, everybody in here knows some cigarette smoking Jezebel goes. <laughs> you know her, don't you? Well, yeah, that's my neighbor. <laughs> Anyway, she fell to the ground, verse 24, and fell at his feet and said, and Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. Isn't that exactly what Moses did? Yeah. Let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let, which means allow not, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. You might want to underline that or circle that or highlight in your Bible somehow, some way. 
For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right here. You know what she's doing? She is bowing herself in submission. This, remember who this is. This is your soul. This is your soul petitioning the Lord. Now, very quickly, let me just say this, and we'll probably close this out, because this is really what I wanted to get across today. Is there anything too small for God to deal with in your life? Anything. So likewise, is there anything too big for God to deal with in your life? Absolutely not. Now, I know God is sovereign, I know God is right, and God is going to fulfill His Word. There's no doubt about it. But let me tell you about law and grace. Because they are the two sides of God's sovereign will in your life. And sometimes it's hard to understand, but that is how it is. You know what we're seeing here? We're seeing here not a story of death, but we're seeing here a story of redemption. And what we're seeing here is, is that the, the demands of the law have to be met. Jesus met the demands of the law. And now we have grace. And here's what Abigail is going to David about. She's not going to David saying, would you kill my husband? She's going to David, number one, asking for forgiveness. And number two, she is petitioning him not to kill her husband and do this evil thing. And I want to tell you something. I'm not, and I don't, don't, it's kind of hard to explain. I don't want you to get me wrong and think that I will tell you that that you can pray outside of the will of God. You cannot. But I will tell you that God hearkens to His people. God hearkens. That, you know what that means? It's got the word here in it. God, now, God was wanting to kill Israel, and Moses said, God, take me instead. And he was teaching the substitutionary death of Christ in that. But Moses was was praying on behalf of his people. And God said, I will not kill them. Abigail's doing the same thing here. She was praying on behalf of a husband that all he was to her was mean, rotten, and cruel. But it was her life. Okay? Boy, this is this is difficult. Because I, I, don't want you to, I don't want to lead you astray to think that you can demand of God whatever you want to, and God will have to give it to you. But what I will say to you is, is that you... In fact, let me get back to Israel. Bless me, and I will release you, is what Jacob said. And the Lord said to Jacob, No longer will you be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince... You have power with God and prevail. Now, if you're here today and you are saved, you have power with God. God listens to His children when they pray. Now, I want you to say amen to that. Like I say, this may, may not be the most profound thing, but what I intend to do is to stir up in your remembrance things that at one time you got a hold of or you said you got a hold of. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. Is there anything too hard for God? Is there any way that's... And I'm going to tell, let, me, let me put it like this. Um, Roy, God intended to kill you. and You had the sentence of death upon you because of your sin. Now, that's not just Roy. That's Gary and Brady and Dad and everybody else here. Somebody say amen. The intention of God, according to the law, was to kill you. But you came to a place. And this is why when you fool yourself into believing that God will just accept you the way you are, you're, I mean, you're, you are deceived. You are deceived. When you came to a place in your life where you knew that you had a sentence of death on you, you know what you did? You fell down on your face before an almighty God and you beseeched God not to give you that sentence of death. Because had David gone in to kill, he would have killed both Nabal, Nabal, Abigail, the whole deal. Would have killed the whole thing. 
Okay? But when you, when you came to the realization in your life that you were going to die and go to hell, that caused you to fall upon your face before God, and at that moment, listen to me, you literally changed God's mind towards you. And it was all according to His will in the Scriptures. But God now, instead of imposing upon you the sentence of death, He has now withdrawn that because Christ has already done that, and you beseeched Him on, on, on your behalf... And now you have power with God and prevailed. You ask God, number one, how, how many have ever asked God, God, forgive me my sins, amen? God, forgive me my transgressions. God, don't kill me. You know what you said? God, I don't want to go to hell. I still don't want to go to hell. I cannot begin to tell you how bad I don't want to go to hell. And that prayer that I prayed, Gary... When I was nine years old, and I didn't know all the theology, I didn't know about David and Abigail, and I didn't know Romans 7. Mike, I just knew that I was a sinner, and that I was going to hell without Jesus. And a sinner bowed his head before God at an altar, and said, God, would you save me? And at that moment, I became Israel. I had power with God and prevailed. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions. Number one, is there any sin that you have committed that God will not forgive? The answer is no. Somebody say amen. So let's say that, let's say that you've been in church now 10, 15, 20 years. And you went out and did something stupid. Will God forgive that sin? Asking. Let me, let me say this to you. In fact, let me, let me come down here. Okay? And this is actually better than having a marriage, marriage fight. Okay? If your wife does something wrong, not saying she did, but if your wife does something wrong, would it be okay for you to go to ask God, God, would you please forgive my wife and God show her the way to live? Would that be okay? Do you think, you think God will listen to you? Now, if you go without getting the beam out of your eye first, amen? It don't work that way. But I, you, hey, would you like a blessed marriage? Husbands, pray for your wives. God, forgive my wife. God help my wife. Ladies, Abigail was praying for a husband who probably didn't deserve anybody praying for him. Ladies, would it be okay for you to go to God and say, God, would you please help my husband? Be a... Ask him little things. God, would you please teach my husband to put the toilet seat down? <laughs> Did you know that it's okay to ask God that, ladies? Let me hear some ladies say amen. Did you know that that's okay? Did you, ladies, let me ask, let me tell you this. God has roles in marriages. Did you know that the lady actually has the greatest role? Because she's the counselor of the husband. Any husband that will say, I have the authority, I make the decisions around here. You're not following the Bible. God did put you in authority. But it's the wife who counsels the husband. Ladies, there's not a thing in the world wrong with you going before God and saying, God, teach me how to counsel my husband. Because that's what Abigail was doing. She, David wasn't her husband yet. But she actually had power over David. She actually healed his wrath. By praying for Nabal. Kids. Young people, listen to me. Is it better, A, to roll your eyes at your parents and think they're stupid? Or B, when you do think your parents are stupid, go in your room, don't slam the door, and say, God, my parents are stupid! 
did you know that you could say things to God that you shouldn't say to anybody else? Raise your hand. How many of you know that? Did you know that it's okay to go in even when you're mad at your mom and dad for not letting you go down to so-and-so's house down there and say, God, fix my parents. Do you know God's smarter than you are? He'll either fix your parents or He'll fix you. Amen? That's how wise and good God is. And all it takes is you asking. Moms and dads, sometimes we correct our children and sometimes we think we've reached a point and we go, I don't know what to do with them anymore. Amen? Did you know that it's okay for you as mom and dad to get alone? And bow your head before God and weep and pray for your children. Say, God, would you please do in my son, my daughter, what I cannot do? Did you know that it's okay to do that? Did you know that God will listen to you? It's okay. That's why... Did did you know it's okay to pray for the President of the United States to be saved? That's why we do it. Because I really... I would really like to see Him in heaven. I would. I would. And it has nothing to do with his politics, but he's lost. He's lost, and he needs to be saved. And you know it's okay to pray for him to be saved. It's okay to, to ask God to change laws in this country, to change people's hearts in this country. It's, o- it's okay to pray for the guy that cut you off on the highway to, to say, God, please help him. It's okay to pray for people that you have a dispute with. It's okay to pray for people that you're angry with. It's, it, I want to tell you, that it's okay to pray for people that you hate, and you do. Oh, no, I don't. It's wrong to hate. <laughs> it's wrong to do a bunch of other stuff, too, that we do. But I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with you praying. Number one, if you think you're on your way to hell, all you've got to do is ask. God, I'm looking at my life right now and there is no way in the world that I can promise you that I can clean up my life. And so if that's the condition, I can't do it. But God, I don't want to go to hell. And God, I, know, I think you have a way to save me from that. God, would you do that? I think God will do it. That's what I think. It's something that I just... just want to help you with today really it's okay to pray you just never know that you might be able to change God's mind concerning yourself concerning something else you just might be able to change God's mind you never know if you don't ask can I hear you say amen you never know if you don't ask Hello folks, Pastor Mike here, and sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation, and some people just don't know what that is, and I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches, and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved, but we also believe in eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6.23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in Him, should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you and God is trying to make you so that, you, just like our parents used to do, God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God, we repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life and you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in His Word, and God has never broken His Word, God promised in His Word that He would forgive you and that He would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.